This is the second set of notes on genetics, chapter 9. Um, in this time, we're going to talk about dihybrid crosses and exceptions to Mendel's, Mendel's principles. So a dihybrid cross, what we did before was a monohybrid cross. That's where you have just one factor that you're crossing. You can also do a dihybrid cross, which is a two-factor cross. And so we're going to look at two traits at the same time. When remember, because of the law of independent, uh, principle of independent assortment, that these alleles do not influence each other's inheritance. And so they're going to be separate things, We're going to, but, but we can look at the two things together. So let's talk about a different kind of plant. These are tall plants that have red flowers, and then we have short ones that have white flowers. Okay, And so we've got the, uh, the T, the capital T that stands for tall, and the capital R that stands for red. And then the lowercase T and R represent the short and the white. And so if you have a true breeding, tall and red, cross with a true breeding short and white, which you're going to get for your offspring. Your all, offspring are all going to be tall and red, but they're going to have, they're going to be heterozygous like we saw the last time. Okay, so now if we cross the F1 generation, the offspring of that, and so we have two heterozygous individuals that are heterozygous for two different traits, we're going to look and see what happens there. So, <coughs> We're going to use the FOIL method to determine the gamete combinations. FOIL, remember, stands for first, outside, inside, last. This is the same method that you use to, to multiply binomials in algebra. Okay, And so what you're going to do is look at the parent here, and you're going to take the first one of each pair, so the big T and the big R, that's what we have here. We're going to use the, out, took the outside ones, so the big T and the little R. We're going to do the inside ones, the little T and the big R. And the last ones in each pair, we're going to take the little t and the little r. So these are the gametes that we can get, the four possibilities of combinations of gametes for these two traits that each one parent can produce. And we're going to have, this, of course, the same ones in both parents. And so then we're going to put it in a Punnett square, and we're going to combine it like this. So when you do this, you're going to put, you're going to, there's a convention, a way you need to do it, okay? Put whichever letter you've got first, you put that one first, put both of them together. <clears throat> and then you're going to put the capital letters always first instead of the lowercase. And so regardless of which one you put where. And so this square, we're going to have two big T's and two big R's, okay? Two big T's and a big R and a little R and so forth. And you do that, fill in all 16 of these spots in your, in your Punnett square, okay? And you get a lot of different combinations here, okay? You can count by looking at the red. You can look at the phenotypes there and look for the look for the the capital R, <coughs> to see how many red tall ones we'll have and how many red short ones and so forth. And so that's what we're going to look at next. When you do a true dihybrid cross, when you're crossing parents that are, that are heterozygous for two different traits, there's a certain ratio, just like we saw a specific ratio in the monohybrid cross for the phenotype and genotype ratio. We're going to have the same type thing in the dihybrid cross, but it's a little bit more complicated because you have more different, out, more possible outcomes. Okay, So in this case, we're going to have in the phenotype ratio, we're going to have nine of them that are tall and red, three that are tall and white, three that are short and red, and one that is short and white. Okay, look here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'm sorry, nine here that are tall and red. We've got three, one, um, two, three that are tall and white. We've got three that are short and red. Here's one, two, three that are short and red. And here's one that is short and white. Okay. So that's when you're going to end up with this phenotype ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. The genotype ratio is a little bit more complicated, okay? <coughs> but this shows that my tall and red ones are going to have three possible genotypes, okay? And they're in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. The tall white ones, uh, the tall red ones, I'm sorry, that's not right. The ones that are tall are going to have 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. The ones that are uh, that that have that are heterozygous for tall are going to have a two to four to two ratio, and the ones that are homozygous for the uh, recessive trait will be also one to two to one there. So you can see the the pattern that forms there. You don't always have to write them like this, and usually when you're writing out things about the dihybrid cross, you're going to be focusing more on the phenotype ratio than on the genotype ratio. And once again, as a reminder, the Punnett square is, is a probability, not a promise. So that all that means is that 
each time there's a fertilization, there's a 9 16th chance that the offspring will be tall and red, or a 1 16th chance that it'll be short and white. It doesn't mean that of the 16, there will be exactly that number. There may be, there may not be, and we'll do some activities in class to illustrate why this might be. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about some other things that are different than what Mendel learned. Mendel studied five, seven different traits of pea plants, and he was very fortunate in the ones that he chose, or maybe he purposely chose those, but the traits that he chose always behaved the same way. Okay, there was, there was simple dominance, but in looking at other traits in other organisms, um, there are some traits that don't work out the same way, okay? And so there's some there's some ones that are that are exceptions to Mendel's laws, and they're just things that he didn't learn about. So one type of inheritance is called incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, you have two different alleles, neither of which it completely dominates the other. You have a blending of the traits. So here we have these are snapdragons, okay? And we have red snapdragons and white snapdragons, okay? Oftentimes when you have an allele that is somewhat, like an allele that has different forms that are dominant, you'll have a, a capital letter that stands for that allele, and then you've got a superscript with an initial for it. And you'll see that on some other things like that. It's not really that important. It's just something that you will see sometimes. All right, so here we have a tree breeding red crossed with a tree breeding white. And what you get in that case, rather than red or white, is you get pink. So there's a blending of the traits there the blending of the characteristics. And then when you cross the heterozygous individuals, you'll get that one to two to one ratio. And this time it's a this time it's a phenotype ratio as well as a genotype ratio in incomplete dominance. So you have <coughs> one fourth that are red, one half that are pink, and one fourth that are white. So incomplete dominance, blending of the traits, and the phenotype ratio is going to be the same as the genotype ratio in the F2 generation. Another uh, example, here, just another slide showing the same thing, basically carnations also have the same kind of thing, you have red and white and pink. <coughs> this shows you cats, and cats colors aren't really like this, it's just a cute little illustration that I found to show here, but it just shows that this, in incomplete dominance you have a blending of the traits, so whether they're black or white you have gray. Cat fur color doesn't work like that, so don't think that that's really what that means. Another uh, example uh, that is different than what Mendel predicted is something called codominance. In codominance, you have two different alleles. Both are dominate, but neither one dominates the other. Both of them are expressed. And so you have, instead of gray kitties this time, you have black and white spotted kitties. Okay, It's a different kind of thing. Again, cat fur color doesn't work like this, but there are some other animals that do. Here's an example of one that works that way. This horse is called a blue roan. And if you look closely at the horse, it's hard to see in the picture here, but if you look closely at it, you'll see that the hairs on the horse are not gray. There are black hairs and there are white hairs. And from a distance, the combination of those looks gray or blue colored. Okay, So this is a heterozygous codominant trait. Uh, some organisms come up with something like this that looks the black and white there black and white hairs that are intermixed with each other. Other times you'll have organisms that have spots like we saw in the example with the kitty cats that wasn't true for cats but, but is true for some other kinds of organisms. Uh, something called a test cross is used to determine the genotype of a hybrid. If you have a, um, a plant like this, like here's a pea plant that has that dominant phenotype but we don't know what the genotype is then we can figure out what the genotype is by doing something called a test cross, okay? And so in the test cross, you take that un unknown genotype that is dominant, the dominant phenotype, okay, and cross it with a recessive phenotype, and then you can figure out whether, whether it's homozygous or heterozygous. So if it's homozygous dominant, then all of the offspring of the cross will be purple, and if it's heterozygous, then half of them would be purple and half would be white. And so a test cross comes in handy a lot of times when you're looking at things that occur in nature uh, or that you, haven't, that you haven't bred yourself so that you can see examples. It's, it's easier to do in some organisms than in others, but it's a useful way to determine uh, or help determine the genotype of a hybrid. Of a hybrid. There are also, in some cases, multiple alleles. This is when you may have more than two alleles in a population that control the trait. An example of multiple alleles is human blood type. Remember a while ago I told you that in, in um, cases where you have a, uh, several different alleles for the same um, trait, 
oftentimes you'll have an initial that stands for the trait, and then you have superscripts with the um, with the alleles to show which allele is which. So in blood typing tests, okay, you've got four different blood types: A, B, A, B, and O. Okay, and if you have two A alleles or an A and an O allele, you'll have type A blood. If you have two B alleles or a B and an O allele, you'll have type B blood. If you have both the A and the B, then you have an A type AB, and if then if you have two recessive alleles, you would have the type O. So uh, the type O is recessive to both the A and the B, but the A and the B are codominant, but there are also three alleles. So this is a case that where there, you have multiple alleles and codominants that occurs here. Uh, <coughs> that what the A and the B code for are um, proteins on the surface of blood cells, and so the type A blood. Uh, would have antibodies against the B and a B uh, antigen or protein. Type B would have antibodies against the type A. If you have type A B blood, you have both both antigens, both um, proteins, but you don't have antibodies to either one. Type O doesn't have either one of those antigens or proteins, but has antibodies against both. And so they use that uh, those characteristics to help determine blood types. And we'll talk more about that later on. Another thing that often occurs in nature that uh, that Mendel didn't know about is something called polygenic traits. These are traits that are that are um, controlled by two or more pairs of genes. An example would be skin color, also hair color and eye color, and various other things like that are are, called, are polygenic. So polygenic here is, is controlled by three pairs of genes. Okay, uh, A, B, and C. Okay, are the ones that we're going to call. That's what we're going to call them here. And so, if you, the more um, dominant genes you have, the darker the skin color would be. The more recessive genes you have, the lighter the skin color would be. And in between, you have the mixing of those. And so, you see this. The graph here shows you the distribution. That more, it's going to be more common to have. Um, the most common is going to be kind of in the middle somewhere with a few individuals at the at the high end and a few individuals at the low end. Please notice that this this white or this light color is not the same thing as albino. Albino is a different trait altogether. It's inherited differently. It's a simple dominance uh, in, uh, inheritance there. It's a it's a recessive trait. And it's totally different from the skin, the normal skin color, because albino is the absence of pigment altogether, and in the first, it occur, it um, affects more than just the skin color. It affects hairs and hair color and eye color as well. And you know, uh, eye color and hair color are like this too. Eye color, I think, has two pairs of genes, and uh, and hair color has several different pairs of genes. I'm not sure how many. It may also be, it may also be, uh, have uh, multiple alleles as well. I'm not really sure about the total inheritance of hair color, but it's, but there are some different things that happen there. That's why you have so many different colors of hair and eyes and skin. Something else that Mendel didn't know about was something called linked genes. This is genes located on the same chromosome. Now the ones that Mendel looked at just happened to be all of them were on separate chromosomes. Six of the seven were on different chromosomes. Two of them were on the same chromosome, but they were pretty far apart, and we'll talk about in just a minute what that means. Okay, so genes that are on the same chromosome are called linked, and what that means is they're likely to be inherited together. So this would be a case where the independent assortment would not necessarily apply. It depends on crossing over and depends on how close together or far apart they are. An easy example to, to talk about is sex-linked genes. These are genes that are located on the X or Y chromosome in humans. In the, now, on, in humans on the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome is a diff, totally different chromosome than the X. It is a shorter chromosome. It has fewer genes, and none of the genes on the Y are the, are code are for the same traits as the ones that are on the X. So a male who receives one X chromosome from his mom and a Y chromosome from his dad, any recessive genes on the X will be expressed in the male. Uh, Sex-linked genes are more commonly found in males. Uh, Sex-linked traits are more commonly found in males than females, but they can occur in females. Just remember that if it's a recessive trait, it, the female is going to have to have two for those recessive alleles for the condition to show up. Examples of linked genes in humans that are really common are uh, really commonly studied are color blindness and hemophilia. Hemophilia is when you have a blood clotting factor that is missing. 
and the blood doesn't clot properly and you, and you bleed severely over very small injuries. This is the condition that Crown Prince Alexei had the, the, in, the, in the Russian royal family that was killed at the beginning of the Russian Revolution. Uh, gene, the way you know about the location of these genes is something by gene mapping. The genes that are located on the same chromosome can be inherited together, but they can be separated by crossing over. And you can actually figure out the relative locations of the genes on the chromosomes uh, by calculating the recombination frequencies. The closer together they are, the, then they're going to be uh, separated less frequently, and so they'll be occurring together. Uh, if they are farther, the farther apart they are, uh, you may not even realize they're on the same chromosome. And that was the case with two of the traits that Mendel studied. They were on the same chromosome, but one was at one end and one was at the other. And so they were more often separated than not. And that it was like them being on separate chromosomes. They were, they were inherited basically the same as they were if they were on separate chromosomes. Here's a picture from your book that shows you a section of the chromosome with linked genes, okay? And so these two are going to have a recombination frequency of 17%, whereas the, these are going to have a closer 9 or 9.5% nine that's going to be much closer together. So they're going to more likely inherit G and C together than you are G and L, or C and L than, than G and L, because they're, they're closer together there. And that makes sense if you think about it. And this completes the notes on exceptions to Mendel and dihybrid crosses.